<clears throat> there we go. Well, um, hope everybody's uh, doing okay in their days of practice. It's been really helpful to actually be able to talk to everyone, uh, you know, and just, I don't know, have a little bit more one-on-one -on -one connection and really see that kind of range of, you know, different conditions, different containers, and the range of experiences that people are having. And that kind of a just amazing way that while there is such a variety of how, you know, what's going on, even in this group, there's there's still that common thread of really being a yogi and um, having, <laughs> you know, going through these things of like all oh, the first few days and uh, the ups and downs and some of the common struggles we have in other conditions, but sometimes maybe a little more bewildering uh, or harder to see when they're happening in our, our own homes or uh, wherever we might be. Sometimes maybe these responses are kind of more naturally sort of integrated and they sneak up on us in a sort of different way. But it's uh, powerful. And I think, you know, just that sense of the particular challenges of practicing at home are also really particularly strengthening in some really important ways, I think, in our spiritual life as yogis as people dedicated to this, there's um, just something so invaluable about being alone in our practice um, or more or less alone, you know, in the range of, of folks here, but that sense of just really um, having to create that stability, having to create that, um, the Hochoka, the little your sacred space. You know, Steve has been talking about that, kind of reminding folks of, you know, there are physical adjustments that you can make, and you know, to kind of attune your home. But, but there's also the sense of how are we just relating to it in a sacred way, and um, how are we responsible for the continued maintenance of that sacredness. Um, and what are the different energies required? It's um, really powerful. And I think there's something that a lot of folks, it seems like are already really having a sense of the value of that, of the, uh, some of the really different um, gifts, benefits and fruits of that work. I think I, um, I haven't been home this time of year ever since I moved to Hawaii. Um, I'd be coming back right now from Massachusetts and sometimes helping up in Canada with um, Pare, Michelle and Steve. And, uh, I realize I'm here also through the summer in a way I, I haven't been for since I've lived here and um, it's requiring a lot more work outdoors, um, especially up on the, on the land that we have in Kohala, um, Vipassana, Hawaii, slowly trying to create something as a place of refuge for people to come and practice and be quiet. And so I bought a very big hat uh, that came in the mail the other day. I, I always like hats and uh, I like big hats, but this is like a giant sombrero, you know, and um, there's to be able to walk outside and just like, there's no part of me that is not in shade. Uh, and, and I feel like I could actually kind of bring some other people in there with me. Uh, is, it's such a powerful, it's so powerful, the sense of knowing how hot the sun is and the sense of what is it, what are these things that create the sense of relief and the sense of protection and, and the shade? Um, I was talking to a friend and this notion arose of, you know, how, how beautiful it would be. What an aspiration to have a, a hat big enough that you could shade your whole village, you know, or shade the whole world. And I think that we come to our practice uh, in some ways, many of us, because we have that same longing, we have that same sense of refuge, of relief uh, in the Dhamma and the Sangha and the Buddhist teachings. 
the the sense that that we all have this capacity to to be incredibly relieved and this coolness of mind and the beauty that that actually offers other people as well that relief and sanctuary that we can be to others with that um when we ourselves are uh, relieved from the heat of the hindrances, from greed, hatred, and delusion, um, where is this coolness that that goes beyond us? How powerful that is, and how much work it takes, you know, even a little sense of that during our day of practice, you know, uh, a little bit of relief of just like coming back to the breath, coming, not even, not even relief with a pleasant experience, it could be an unpleasant experience, but the sense of, oh, we're with it. We're not running. We're not distracting ourselves. We're not um, trying to turn it into something else. But the honesty of equanimity, of the Dhamma, of the reality of what's happening, there's such a relief in that. And there's a time where the Buddha was teaching up on this mountain, and people from all over came it is said, you know, from this region to, and, and lay people, but also, you know, wandering ascetics from different traditions. Uh, it says, as a thirsty person seeks cool water, as a merchant seeks great profit, or one oppressed by heat seeks shade, they hastily climb the mountain. I think there's... Uh, something so beautiful in that sense of as a thirsty person seeks cool water, as one oppressed by heat seeks shade, that we come to the Buddha, we come to these teachings, we come to this practice, these offerings, this community, to feel that relief, that rest that we know is possible out of compassion for ourselves, compassion for others. There's a lot of ways that it's spoken of in the suttas. I like this also from the Sutta Nipata. He says, so the Buddha, this person named Kappa, for those standing in the midst of the stream, when a perilous flood has arisen, for those oppressed by old age and death, declare an island, dear sir. And the Buddha responds, for those standing in the midst of a stream, when a perilous flood has arisen, for those oppressed by old age and death, let me declare an island for you. Owing nothing, owning nothing, taking nothing. This is the island with nothing further. I call it Nibbana, the extinction of old age and death. Having understood this, those mindful ones are quenched in this very life. They do not come under Mara's control, nor are they Mara's footmen. And so this other metaphor of you know, this stream, sometimes it's spoken of as this, you know, it's this torrential stream that's a fabrication that we're in of just constant inundation with experience, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral of all the sense doors. Declare us an island. Owning nothing, taking nothing. This is the island with nothing further. I call this Nibbana. Having understood this, those mindful ones are quenched in this very life. There's a few, I'll read his responses to a few different uh, questioners here. Here he's speaking to Metagu. Whatever you comprehend, Metagu, above, below, and across, in the middle, having dispelled delight and attachment to these, consciousness would not permit persist in existence. A bhikkhu, 
so dwelling, mindful, heedful, having given up taking things as mine. Right here, such a wise one might abandon suffering, birth and old age, sorrow and lamenting. Sayadaw Panyananda, who's been teaching at the Chazwa retreat the last few years as our monastic teacher, always makes a point to remind us that when we see this word bhikkhu, of course, there is the, the, the word in which it's referring to the monks, you know, at the time of the Buddha. But um, he says it's very clearly understood in the tradition that it means anyone, like anyone who's a yogi, anyone who's practicing, uh, that, that this, this quality of renunciation um, and dedication to the practice. A bhikkhu, so dwelling, mindful, heedful, having given up taking things as mine. Right here, such a wise one might abandon suffering, birth, old age, sorrow, and lamenting. Oh, one more. He's speaking to Jatukani. Remove greed for sensual pleasures, Jatukani, said the Blessed One. Having seen renunciation as security, do not take up or reject anything. Let neither of these exist for you. Dry up what pertains to the past. Do not take up anything to come later. If you will not grasp at what's in the middle, you will live at peace. For one entirely devoid of greed for name and form, the influxes do not exist by which one might come under death's control. For one entirely devoid of greed for mind and matter, right? For anything that might arise. Having seen renunciation as security, do not take up or reject anything. This is the, um, the name of this course that we're on, of seeing security everywhere. That phrase comes from an, another sutta where the Buddha really frames this, this distinction between the person who is anxious about everything, who is overwhelmed by the flood of fabrications and is grasping at this and rejecting that and tuning out and having deluded notions about um, other phenomena, the hardship, the oppression of that and the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the restlessness that develops out of that way of being compared to the sage, the wise one, the muni, the tathagata in this case, he, this sense of to see security everywhere, that there is a happiness that is a, a peaceful happiness. It's a happiness we almost don't recognize in our everyday terms of happiness that is beyond the need for things to be one way or the other, that isn't troubled by the arising and passing of phenomena, that is beyond conditions. And not beyond conditions by rejecting them, by avoiding them, but by this very delicate practice of being in such perfectly, powerfully mindful relationship with them so that we're aware of what's happening. There is the natural um, arisal of <clears throat> compassion, of joy, and of peace with every moment of experience. If it's a painful experience, compassion naturally flows. If it's a pleasurable experience, joy naturally flows, yet neither disrupting this powerful steadiness of unperturbability of the mind and heart. What does it mean? What would it really mean for us to see security everywhere and to have this very different kind of security that isn't based on all of the ways we normally try to find security, normally try to come to a sense of stability and solidity of relief and seeing that so many of these very deep ancient patterns in us of ways we find stability, of ways we come to feel safe, um, 
are actually quite insecure, right? That that they don't provide real safety and sometimes actually create a lot more instability in our lives or the lives of those around us. I've recently been liking the not having to be on an airplane <clears throat> and um, but I, I really have uh, you know there's a lot one learns in that kind of environment about oneself and others and I I was struck the last time I uh, was flying and we hit a very long patch of turbulence and so it's that kind of experience where you can see your initial reaction and then it keeps going and, and you just sort of see like, okay, well, if the turbulence really lasts a long time, it's different than that sort of initial jolt and how do you, how does one work with it, you know? And so for myself, just really seeing um, just how hilarious, I, I found as like such a hilarious in a way that I hadn't before, that when the, the plane is shaking, that there's this very powerful impulse to just grab onto my seat, right? To grab on to the thing that's like totally unstable. You know, this thing that's like rocketing through 30,000 feet in the air, being blown around by the winds. And yet this impulse to just find solidity, find security, that there's still something comforting in grabbing on to the metal, the plastic, that which feels firm, even though it's not solid at all. And there's no security in that process, you know, uh, and not, of course, getting upset with myself or being like, don't do that, just relax or trying to convince myself I shouldn't, but just like the, the beauty of that purity of like, right, this is what the heart does. This is what the mind does. It grabs on, it clings on. It tries to find solidity anywhere it can in this relentless torrent of change that we find ourselves in. I think as yogis at home, we're confronted with those patterns in a very profound way as well. You know, that there are so many ways that we will seek security in the undependable in so many ways, right? In terms of uh, distraction, entertainment, busyness of whatever kind, um, food, uh, chores, right? There's all these things that need to get done in the life of a householder. And there's a way that we may even resent them, but that they provide a sense of meaningfulness, a sense of identity, a sense of security in their doing. Um, and when we're not at a retreat center and we're in our familiar space, sometimes those watching those patterns uh, can feel very intense, you know, very uh, humbling at best. And sometimes um, dispiriting, you know, of how, how much we might go to our phones or the internet, you know, and try to find um, something entertaining, something to deal with, you know, more news, more emails, more, just because our systems are so uncomfortable in just the non-doing presence, right, of just being with the flood of fabrications as they're moving one of the main ways that we find security is through views. The Buddha really spoke a lot about this attachment to views and this fixation on views and arguing about views, um, conceptual frameworks and notions about anything, um, who we are, who someone else is. It's like the, the realm of views is, you know, I mean, it's as vast as anything because it's mostly the world we live in, right? If, especially where it's harder to see, we're online all the time, we're reading news about here, we're getting messages from this place. We, we forget that so much of that is not our actually direct experience. What's happening in our direct sense experience is all that isn't view. And everything else actually ends up falling into the realm of view, of notions, and, and we're mostly living in this world of um, constructs. Now those constructs may in fact represent in a pretty coherent way the actual world. So it isn't to say that they're wrong, but it is 
amazing to see the degree to which we are living in those constructs as a as a security as um a sense of creating a sense of stability of righteousness or of wrongness right some of us are addicted to being right some of us are addicted to being wrong uh as michelle was saying the other day that's conditioning you know uh most likely you know beyond this lifetime actually understanding that it's there doesn't, and then getting free within it doesn't mean figuring it all out necessarily, understanding why we're like one way or the other, but observing these patterns, these contractions of the mind. I, like quite a number of years ago, I, I, I became, <laughs> really aware of this very powerful pattern I have on retreat where at some point on almost any time I'm on retreat I will go through some period of time where I get into this huge argument in my mind with the Mahayana traditions uh, you know I'll just I'll, it's like I won't see whatever the sort of trigger is like something will start to kind of something will happen and i'll start to just have these thoughts about like God, you know some of these people think they are like trying to think they can save all sentient beings you know and uh so arrogant you know and uh you know bragging about how maha their yana is and you know disparaging us for you know our understanding of what the buddha taught and uh you know it's it's like it and boy it can go on you know uh like really on and I think that it was probably this one, a few years ago when I did like six six month retreat. It was just so humbling to just see how pervasive and how deep this like this fight I was picking with nobody, right? There was no one there. It was just in my mind. I'm just like I couldn't. I just kept going, and um, and uh, you know, finally, it was like, oh God. I don't, you know, there was a period of like, why am I doing this? You know, maybe I've had a hundred lifetimes as, you know, someone who felt, you know, abused by these Mahayanas or whatever, you know, it's like, where does this come from? It's not even, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel like it was from anything really a particular or aggrieved situation that occurred to me. But I, I, I really came to start to see that it's like, oh, it always happens around a certain set of experiences and conditions in my practice where things will be going along and often I'll, I'll get much quieter I'll sort of drop in and feel like a kind of peace with just things as they are and then something will happen you know the equanimity will drop or the concentration will drop or something more disturbing will uh, impact my practice and there's a kind of like shakiness that arises there's a disturbance there's a sense of the vulnerability of that lack of protection. If the mindfulness isn't there and the concentration isn't there and the equanimity isn't there, suddenly one realizes the only protection we have are greed, hatred, and delusion. And these are what we've developed as protections. And so I see the mind going to this aversive place of like, okay, I'm gonna, the, the degree to which it felt like it needs that sense of security of me and mine and my view and my rightness and my like and and just like with every step of walking meditation just being more right and more right and this person more wrong and more and it's like wow what a prison you know what a what a painful way to live and and yet the process that I had to go through was not just chastising myself, right? It's like the airplane thing. It's like, we don't just say, oh, stop doing that. You're being ridiculous, you know? You will hear that voice in your head of like, what's wrong with you? Just practice, stop this, you know? And it's like, okay, you get, you get that there's some wisdom in that view also, but can we actually be interested, not in the content of the thought, but in the emotional undercurrents that are playing out? Why does this view, what does it feel like it's protecting me from? Why am I, why is the mind and heart keep insisting on this thing? And that's what's so amazing about view is like we, we conjure something and it makes us feel solid. It makes us feel right or it makes us hate or it makes us whatever. It makes us love. It makes us want. It makes us whatever. And yet it doesn't last, which is 
the nature of Vipassana. We start to see nothingness. And so we have to keep reasserting it. We have to keep reasserting it in order to feel that sense of solidity and to feel that sense of reassurance and solidness and uh, fixedness. And so that's this compulsion of these, these thought patterns that may arise, you know, of our view about something, or maybe it's just a song that's stuck in our head. It's like, whoa, the mind is needing something to grab onto. The mind feels unsafe in the flux of conditions. And so this is one pattern that it's learned to do. And it's like, can we be interested? Can we be gentle? It's like, oh, of course, of course the mind wants this. Of course the mind is locked in on this thing. But can we not pay so much attention to it and feel like, oh, we can feel the emotional undercurrent. We can feel there's something that feels pained or grieved, uh, threatened, scared. Can we bring that sense of attention and kindness and warmth and invite it? And it's like, oh, I understand why the heart doesn't feel safe in this moment. It's going to this thing. And now it's amazing. You know, of course, the, the pattern will still emerge on retreat, but it's, it doesn't last. And it has, a, there's a lightness to it. There's a, when I notice, I'll walk, I'll notice some thought, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, and it's like, oh, I just can't, I can't, I laugh, right? It's like, oh, something must be going on. If you can start to recognize, oh, these certain thought patterns, it's like, oh, maybe there's a, vulnerability, right? Maybe I'm starting to feel like that need to cling on to something, the need to develop a view, to get solid. And it's like, oh, can I be interested? Do I need, I don't need to follow that path. My view can be right or wrong. That isn't the point of the practice. You know, this isn't about the purification of view in that way of like getting the right view and getting the perfect concept and framework for how we understand anything. It's realizing like, wow, there's a prison of compulsion that the mind keeps putting itself in as a way of uh, being, feeling good about ourselves or feeling bad about ourselves in a way that feels uh, safe because at least that's solid. Even if, the, even if the compulsion is like, oh, I'm such a terrible person, it's the same compulsion as like, I'm, I'm so much more right than these other people. It's the same need to be me of the fixation of you of whether it's better than, worse than, or equal to. The Buddha said that over and over and over and over again. Better than, worse than, equal to. It's the same prison, both creating the solidity that feels safer. And where do we want relief from that? Where do we start to feel the oppressiveness of that? And it's like, oh, where can we find that sense of relief of coming back to the practice, coming back to our anchor, coming back from the, the non-conjured, the non-fabricated, internally fabricated experience. And part of it is developing a taste for it, right? Or developing a taste for the, the relief of the shade of the truth, the shade of just the reality of what's happening, <clears throat> the coolness of those waters, the, the quenchedness that we can feel. We stop running, stop fighting, stop trying to make something happen. But it also requires a strength of this vulnerability. And, and that's not necessarily intuitive for a lot of us. We might understand it intellectually, but in what way is this vulnerability actually safe is something that it takes a very long time for the heart to trust, the mind to trust. Um, there's, it, it, you have to allow the, the heart and mind to contract back into where it feels safe, even if we know that it's not um, the deepest wisdom and then trust that if you allow it to do that, but don't buy into it, don't feed it too much, it'll start to slowly feel safe again in the reality of what's happening. It's very subtle. And that's the reason why we have to, it's the reason why we, 
we practice in the way that we do and we offer like the noting practice, you know, um, the sense of like, can we keep track of what's happening in a momentary way, uh, in a way that is um, uh, watching a chain of events unfold? It helps us get a little bit out of the sense of the security, uh, the, the sense of security that's developed by grasping or by views. We start to kind of puncture that by being willing to watch what happens, right? Like, oh, why is the heart doing this? Why is, what was just happening? Sometimes it takes a little reflection, right? It's not just, in the moment precision. It's like, can we look back and say, oh, you know what, there's some, this happened and this happened and, and maybe there was something there I didn't see. I'll keep an eye out for it next time. And then next time we look and we see, oh yeah, right? There was like real quiet. And then there was something that was very unpleasant and there was a feeling of vulnerability and then this contraction of the heart and, and, and being able to watch in a momentary way what leads to what. And this is why that Mahasi style of practice is encouraged, why there's a sense of like, oh yeah, why is it worth noting rising, falling, pressure, tension, tightness? It's like, because you start to see, oh, tightness, unpleasant, unpleasant, aversion, aversion, not liking, oh, perception, an idea of what it is, a view that arises, a sense of me arises, a sense of them arises right? We watch the unfolding experience, how it happens, and it's generally the opposite of how we talk about it. Usually we'll say, oh, I heard a car honk outside, right? And it's like, okay, I heard car horns honk outside. Well, if you were to watch that in the momentary way in our practice, that's totally the opposite direction of what actually happened, which is there was a sound at the ear door. It maybe had a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral sensation, uh, a perception, a, a notion, an idea, a view of what that sound was arose in the mind. And maybe there was initially an image in the mind of a vehicle. Maybe there was the name car. Maybe there was a horn. Maybe there was a not liking. Maybe there was a like, I'm embarrassed. Someone else heard that. Brrr. Right? It's like, actually, it was like honking car I, right? It's like me is the last thing that arises. It's like the sense sound arises, all of these things sort of chain. And then finally, there's this perception of car and meanness. And that's how we start to dismantle the the perceived solidity of the reality that we tend to be living in. It's like watching it in a momentary way, watching that it's like, it's not actually happening at all how we view things. We're not sitting here with me at the center, watching, oh, sound arise here, the breath arise down here, light is happening here, and I'm kind of in the middle, you know, pulling the levers. That's generally some version of that is how we think of ourselves in our lives. But if we watch it closely, it's not happening in that way at all. Mind and matter are being conditioned by one another and conditioning by one another in any moment, right? There's the lifting, the, the, physic, the mental intention to lift the foot has to happen before the foot lifts. There has to be this moment of, okay, there's this volitional impulse of the mind lifting. And then it's like, okay, and then the, the foot starts to lift. There's a physical sensation that the mind then becomes aware of. And there's a perceptive quality of where, where's the body in space? And then a mental impulse again. Okay, well, keep lifting. At some point, oh, I'll just move forward. At some point, down. But what's actually happening is this sequence of events between mind and matter that is essential to starting to break us out of the perception of self and other, the perception of who we are, what the world is, what's providing security. And it's scary, it's hard, it's hard to do this. It's hard to feel like that's a secure process. And we don't like the training. We don't like, oh, it feels like very rote to be like, oh, rising, falling, lifting, placing. And it's like, yes, of course, there's a, it takes some restraint of the mind. It takes some dedication, some determination, some discipline. And yet, what are the fruits of that? Are we willing to have some sense of self-restraint as yogis, 
of course, yogis at home, it's harder. There's no restraint imposed on us, you know? There's not a huge group of other people also being in silence or no one's out there checking their phones or reading even, right? The sense of when you see someone doing something a little bit out of the norm, boy, it feels like an infraction of the space. And yet how, how are we keeping our own space? Are we really holding it sacred to ourselves? Are we uh, treating ourselves and our own practice with that same respect that we would expect of other yogis if we were in a, a Dhamma center? Can we hold ourselves capable of that? Can we aspire to that? And give ourselves rest and relief and knowing that it's very hard and that without the security, yes, maybe we do uh, give ourselves a sense of safety and peace and security that's not always pure you know, Dhamma insight. It's like going resting, having a cup of tea and just staring out the window, you know, enjoying nature. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ways in which it's like, we're not saying that you should be sitting, walking, sitting, walking, sitting, walking, sitting, walking all day. You know, we recognize that can come from a bad place, uh, an unskillful place. You know, the sense of even our own practice can be motivated by this wanting wanting to attain something, wanting to get something, wanting concentration, wanting wisdom, wanting insight. Why? It's like mm, that, that contraction of the mind. We treat our practice just like we're treating, you know, some other phenomena in the world, scheming. I've, I really, I recently learned that Pali word. I love it. Akuhako, the schemer. Sounds like, it sounds like it could be a Hawaiian word, doesn't it? It's like the same uh, sound. Aku is a kind of fish, I think. But anyways, that sense of like, you know, the Buddha talks about, oh, just like how people are just scheming all the time, you know? And of course that has like a sort of insidious flavor maybe in the English language, but the sense of like, oh, we're always trying to get something, plan something, you know, it's like, what's next? What's next? What's next? Where does the attention just like rest, abide in what is? you know, all these plans for profit and fame and, you know, attainment or whatever. And it's like, oh, where do we find that relief, the coolness of release? And where do we really understand that our practice has to come from a similar place? It takes energy. It takes discipline. It takes effort. But if that effort is tainted with aversion, you know, or craving, that it's, it's actually not going to lead us to where, where we want to go. It can get, you know, you can, some things can, you can get concentrated with uh, distorted effort, you know, in that way at times, but it will be exhausting, you know, it'll deplete us versus the kind of energy that, 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 that builds energy, the kind of concentration that, that builds and, and that actually starts to require less and less forcefulness of mind. Right, this ability for the attention to be concurrent with what's happening with less and less effort. It takes energy to get going. But we have to be very careful about what is motivating that energy. I think I'll just say a little more about just, you know, that it's, um, it does take some discipline, but that discipline isn't actually the most important quality. And I think that as yogis at home, that can be confusing because we see how un undisciplined we are. And it can be a real self, um, a place where we're hard on ourselves, where it's like, oh, you know, like, I, I, it's very hard to just, Mm, always behave as we think a yogi should behave. And to be just be very careful about the self-judgment in that as well, you know, that, 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 that determination for the freedom and for the peace is much more important than discipline. And that determination to be free can really look like a lot of different things. It might not always look like you imagine what it would be to be the perfect yogi, you know, to be uh, the, your vision of who the yogi you think you would like to be or your enlightened version of yourself as, a, you know, uh, the yogi of your dreams. Uh, but rather like the reality of what you're working with and 
that while in some cases there's a place of restraint, there's also a place of relaxation that's necessary. And too much what we think of as discipline can again come from an unhealthy place. It can come from self-hatred versus self-interest. And to really recognize that there is something, one of the benefits about being at home and, and uh, not being, you know, with such a group of other people is that you do have a little more flexibility. You do have, you, know, you can rest, you can do more lying meditation. You know, you can uh, do a different kind of walking meditation, you know, depending on the conditions people are in, outdoors, indoors. You know, this, Michelle will talk about useless gazing sometimes, you know, and it's like, I find, you know, that, long before I ever came to my meditation practice, I love just sitting on my stoop in the various places that I've lived. I just like sit on the stoop and watch the cars go by, watch the people go by, watch the birds, watch the trees, whatever, whatever was there. The sense of like, or at a park, you know, uh, just like watching, watching the mind's judgments, watching the mind's views, watching the opinions, but like also seeing this coming and going, there can be a, a looseness to the practice in that way as well. That, that it may not feel as precise always, right? The attention that, you, that it's hard. As a yogi at home, you have to do the dishes. You have to clean. Most people are having to cook. Most people are, you know, like you're, it's going to be punctuated. You're not going to always feel the same natural ability to just kind of drop in and, and be concentrated uh, for those people who, for whom that might be easier on a self, on a, a retreat with other people. There's, uh, a sense that that concentration will can get broken more easily. Uh, and, and it's like to get that you can still have a just as versatile mind, just as versatile a practice. We don't need to rush through our yogi jobs. You know, it's not just about the formal sitting periods. What is it to take your time eating, to take your time cleaning, to be very slow with these things, to be very inefficient? How do we cultivate our inefficiency? Um, I remember the first time I really ever went on any kind of retreat was at uh, one of Thich Nhat Hanh's monasteries used to be in Vermont. And the, the dishwashing process at the end was like so slow. Like, I was like, you know, they would take one plate, you put it in the one bucket, you know, put it in the next bucket and put it in the next bucket, wash it, rinse it, dry it, put it away. And I was like, <laughs> like do like 10 plates at a time, you know, boom, 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 boom. You could like, we'd be done with this, you know? And it was like, great. You know, they were like, you're just like not getting what we're doing. You know, like that isn't the point at all. You know, <laughs> it's like, wow, what is the relief of like, oh, you're not just fixated on where you're trying to go and getting it done. It's like feeling the soap, you know, feeling the warmth of the water, feeling the coolness of the water, feeling the dryness and the wetness. And, you know, that's like just being with it. And that lack of agitation, the relief of that, how can that, how can we provide that relief for ourselves, right? Be that shade for ourselves throughout our day, not be so agitated about it's the sitting and the walking, sitting and the walking. It's like, no, your whole day. We, so many people go to retreats and they come back to their lives and this, this, this frame, oh, I wish I could be more integrated. Why isn't my retreat life integrating into my home life? And it's like, yeah, here you go. This is it. And look how hard it is and why we don't do this, why we avoid this. Because it can feel very unprotected. It can feel like, oh, there's too many things calling the attention. I can't, I don't have the protection. And so it's important to recognize the value of the deep protection of a retreat center, but also be like, and it's possible here. We can relate to these, you know, the ping of our computer or the light going out or whatever as in, in a very different way. And that training will integrate into our lives. What, what you're learning here as independent yogis is priceless and hard and um, will be of just immeasurable benefit as time goes on. I'll just, you know, there's the end with this. The, the, um, there's a famous Taoist story um, from Chuang Tzu of... Uh, these, this group of um, carpenters who are on their way to a, a big project uh, that they've been um, called to, to work on. And uh, on their way, they go through this town, this village. And in the center of this village is just this enormous tree. This is just like a beautiful, incredible uh, tree, bigger than any that any had ever seen. 
and it provided this just incredible sanctuary for this the people of this village uh for the animals of the village that people would go there to rest and they would go there to gather and they would eat and they would you know so much of life would happen and it provided such a powerful um place for this community and uh these carpenters rested and they had their lunch and then they went on their way and um sometime later one of the apprentices asked the master he said he's like i just have to say you know we're all a bunch of carpenters and none of us have ever seen a tree like this you know it was mind-boggling um and our whole time there you never mention anything about as carpenters what we might do with a tree like that you know uh, how would we make use of a tree like that? And uh, there are different versions of the story. Um, but in one, the, the tree spirit comes to him in his dream. And the tree said to him, I've tried for a long period to be useless. Many times I was in danger of being cut down, but at length I've succeeded. And so I've become exceedingly useful to myself. Had I indeed been of use, I would not have been able to grow to this height. And that's what the carpenter said. He's like, oh, that tree is tangled here and knotted there and burls here. And he's like, the, everything about that tree was totally useless for anything helpful. You know, if you tried to make a boat out of it, it would sink. If you tried to make a house out of it, it would creak and fall over. That tree was entirely useless. And that's how it got so old. That's how it got to be so beautiful and provide such beauty and rest for the world around it. And so there's something about that in our own practice of cultivating our uselessness, of seeing all the ways in which we're, uh, our agendas, our, our schemes, our plans, our trying to do this, our wanting to do that, how it's like so exhausting. And if you're useful, you will be used you know, by yourself or by others? And where can we cultivate the wandering, the peace with the wandering mind, right? The acceptance of, of not always even trying to oppress ourselves with our spiritual practice, right? Through trying to get some idea of what we want to get to, of a fantasy of what we're trying to do versus just letting, training the mind to just settle with what is and that total peace and total dysfunctionality of that, right? And actually, what a beautiful thing that provides for ourselves, what a beautiful thing that might provide for others. Mm, can we find the goodness of that? Can we find the respite, the security of that goodness versus the security of our identity? of what we're always trying to do. So just to be very careful, you know, as, as yogis independent or, or back on retreat uh, at a center, how much time are we spending just thinking about stuff? You know, it's, it's, of course, we all are gonna do it. We all spend a lot of time thinking about stuff as yogis and as people in the world. But in this particular circumstance, it's just important to remember, it's like, okay, the mind is gonna do that to feel safe. The mind is gonna do that to feel secure. But where can you let it go and just rest and be with the practice? Pressure, tightness, tingling, warmth, wanting, not wanting. Intention to move, intention to lift, intention to eat, intention to sleep. To not squander our time with still these incredible conditions and support, just thinking about things, just reaffirming our views. We have all the time in the world to do that. Here, there's an opportunity to do something different. And can we abide in that? So let's just uh, sit for a few minutes and abide in our uselessness.
as a thirsty person seeks cool water, as a merchant seeks great profit, or as one oppressed by heat seeks shade, they hastily climb the mountain. So may the shade we provide ourselves, our homes, the beings and objects in our lives that we encounter, may they all be relieved. May we all be relieved by the shade of this good Dhamma. So we have some time for walking or useless abiding. See you at the Metta Chant. <laughs>